This week on Crunch Week, we're talking about Apple's new iPhones, Twitter's impending IPO, and all the NSA talk at Disrupt. Hey there, I'm Colleen Taylor. I'm Mike Butcher. And I'm Bill Yager. And welcome to a brand new episode of Crunch Week, where we talk about the most exciting stories of the past seven days in tech and what a seven days it has been. Uh, I think we should start off by talking about what always takes a lot of headlines is new Apple stuff, the iPhone 5S and 5C. Or is it the 5Z? Who knows? <laughs> Could be anything. The naming conventions of this company are getting more and more ridiculous as the days go by. Yes, yeah, because now it's Friday when we're filming this, and, and the 5C has come up for sale. But it's been kind of surprising it hasn't sold out right away like previous new iPhones have done. Do you, why do you think that is, Billy? I mean, it's interesting. I, I think Mike made a good point about this earlier. I think that you know, people are a little confused about what the different ones are, what the specs are. You look at, people made good points that they're starting to differentiate the iPhone lines. And you look at the, the MacBook line where there's the Pro and the Air. But the iPhone 5 line and 5C is not as clear as sort of, well, Pro are going to get better specs, but it's going to be a little heavier than Air is a pretty good indicator that it's a really lightweight traveling computer. So the 5S and the 5C, you know, they're, they're great phones. I think the naming conventions are a little off, though. Yeah, what happened to the 5A, exactly? <laughs> um, I think, I mean, but it's clear that Apple had to bring out this uh, slightly lower spec uh, phone in order to reach um, a new emerging markets in particular. I mean, people... I mean, the, the growth of Android is enormous. And I, I was in Africa earlier this year in Cape Town, and uh, really the smartphones are dominated by uh, um, Android. Right. So um, Apple really has to get on that uh, as soon as possible. I was actually just talking to a startup today that was uh, mobile first and iOS first and only. And I asked the CEO when they're planning on putting out an Android version of their app, and he actually said now with the 5C, they don't really see the need. It's not as urgent as it had been for them to come out on Android because they think that the 5C is going to allow them to expand their reach just as an iOS app because they expect more people to buy iPhones. I do think that the price point of the 5C surprised a lot of people. I know you know so many leaks for this this release for Apple that not a lot of things surprised us. But I think um, I saw reports about that, that it's actually been more expensive in some places overseas, which is. Obviously, very surprising because in the U.S. we have those subsidized phone contracts. So you know, eight hundred dollar iPhone cost me actually a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars through Verizon. Right, right. Yes, and absolutely. And in Europe, people typically like to buy unlocked phones, which so mean they can swap around their providers, um, and uh, and that bumps up the initial cost of it. I mean, now we're looking at this. Uh, the 5S. Uh, I was just thinking about changing myself in the future, and uh, you know, the top of the range, new top of the range iPhone 5S will be uh, 700 pounds. I mean, that is an enormous amount of money to pay for a mobile phone, and so quite a few people are going to be balking, I think, uh, t to some extent. And you know, th do they really want to switch from you know the 4S? It's still a pretty good phone. Um, up to you know, the, Apple's talking about the you know the fingerprint sensor and the and the better camera, etc. Is it going to be? Is it going to be enough to make people jump? Do you think in Europe, particularly, it sounds like you're a little skeptical? Uh, I mean, we're 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 big iPhone fans in Europe, but the uh, yeah, it, it is a lot of money to pay. I mean, certainly, concentrate a few people's minds. It is. Well, speaking of leaks, uh, Apple had a lot of leaks, but one company that kept their stuff airtight this week was Twitter. Uh, even though Dick Costello came on stage to disrupt, talked, I mean, they've been out and about a lot, but no one knew that they were making first the biggest acquisition that they've ever made, a $350 million purchase of Mopub, which was announced earlier this week. And then uh, later in the week, they filed their S1 to finally officially start the ball rolling toward going public. What do you think about the Twitter IPO? Well, I think it's interesting that uh, if you, you know, people have been deciphering uh, that, that one tweet, you know, how much you can get out of 140 <laughs> characters. But it's interesting that they said they had filed their S1, not necessarily that they filed it on the day they tweeted that. And so there's some, some good stories out, uh, I think, today and yesterday, you know, explaining that actually they, they started filing some stuff earlier and they, they could actually IPO in 2013, which would be earlier than what a lot of us expected. Yes, uh, I, I think gather that from a lot of the reporting on the subject that uh, they've been working with the SEC for a few months ab about this. I mean, obviously, Twitter was going to IPO. I mean, it was far too expensive to buy. Um, <laughs> unless, Although, unless Apple wanted to uh, exactly. replace its ping service. <laughs> there are a few companies um, that could do it. And, and some people are still saying, you know, 
this could be the smartest thing for Google to buy Twitter. Mm. You know, it would be it would be smart even if it does cost them fifteen billion dollars. It it could be a smart move. It would have fixed their Google Plus problem, <laughs> sort of the <laughs> tumbleweeds rolling through <laughs> Google Plus. Sorry about Google Plus uh, uh, people out there, um, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, the IPO is absolutely natural, but I mean, you can see that the sort of the timeline that they brought out their advertising uh, I, API earlier this year. And uh, but one of the one of the uh, stories that's quite hap interesting about the Twitter IPO is the fact that they've it looks like that they not uh, don't actually have as many people. Uh, on the platform as a lot of people previously thought. Uh, right. I think there's about, about 240 million, a lot of people, and whereas their own internal targets are closer to something like 400 million. Right. Uh, so uh, it's interesting to see that's that angle coming out at the moment. Well, this is the issue with so many companies now that get venture rounds up to series E, F, G, H, you know, which is where Twitter is. They've raised more than a billion dollars from outside investors and they've been around since 2006. Mm -hmm. So this is something that uh, here we are seven years later and they're just getting that process started toward an exit. And you've got to ask, are there fastest growing days behind them and what investor wants to jump on you know a train that's slowing down that's not necessarily the ideal investment proposition but that's the same uh, situation that Facebook was in last year and a lot of these other companies that have been venture funded for a long time yeah well there's always a question I mean you know people talk about Twitter as, as the heartbeat of the internet and then Facebook talks about being you know the social graph of the internet but you always wonder you know is it gonna be the graph of that one million people and then people get sick of it and leave and you know, even see the negative growth, or are we going to see, you know, as, as Mark Zuckerberg said earlier this week, the entire world on on Facebook and on Twitter, and sort of, you know, the way they use the internet, they they automatically have these accounts. So it, it, it's always a guessing game, sort of. Yeah, I still I love Twitter. It's really the first thing that I check every morning. But I am in the media, and I am in sort of the tax sphere, and so I am that that part of the echo chamber, I guess, that they always get criticized and for. And in, in emerging markets, um, Twitter hasn't done interesting things in the same way that Mark Zuckerberg has approached the issue. For instance, he's done sort of zero data contracts with uh, sort of emerging emerging economy telco, telco providers. Part of the reason that the Arab Spring um, uh, came came about over the last couple of years ago was that people were using Facebook fa effectively free on their mobile phones. Uh, you know, the, I think the famously the zero dot Facebook dot com URL was free to access from many mobile providers, and so um, but Twitter hasn't cut many of those telco deals uh, it, outside outside of the U.S. So it's um, you know that they need to get the, get on the, the growth train. Uh, in the same way that Facebook has, you know, managed to reach, uh, uh, you know, nearly two billion people. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, but last thing here, you know, the good thing about Twitter is that they were not found to comply with the NSA in the Prism program, and so they got a lot of positive press earlier this year about that. But mm. uh, NSA was still a hot topic of conversation at our Disrupt conference this week. Uh, Mike Arrington made it a point to ask every person that he talked to about NSA, and I know you're working on a story about this, or you published a story already about this. Uh, publishing t uh, tomorrow morning, which I guess is Saturday when the <laughs> country will be out, so probably already published once we publish this. <laughs> and what, can you give us a hint, what, what did you kind of analyze from this? I mean, all the biggest names talked about it. Uh, yeah, Lisa I mean, Meyer, Zuck. Yeah, I mean, Mike Arrington talked to, I think, 13 people on stage um, and asked every single one of them about the NSA, and then I believe Alexia Tsotsis also asked Max Levchin, and Josh Constein asked Drew Houston. Uh, and, and Arrington's interviews included, you know, everything from Zuckerberg, Arrington, and Meyer, uh, a bunch of VCs. So some of the biggest names in tech, some of the biggest names in, in business, uh, were up on stage talking about this massive program. And so it was really interesting. We compiled sort of all the responses and, and broke it down and did sort of a, a best of highlight reel and looked at sort of, you know, the tension between this, uh, you know, these people and, and they're building these technologies that are, are huge and are used by all of us. Many times for free, like you could Facebook. I don't, I don't pay for a Facebook account, uh, but then you know are also implicated in this NSA program, as well as I think a lot of the VCs in particular and, and Max Levchin made really good points about the balance between you know freedom and and security and you know, what kind of freedom we're talking about. In some ways, talking about that, though, I found it a little disappointing, a lot of these responses, because they seem to just be kind of parroting the the official line that comes straight from the top from President Obama that, you know, it has to be this balance between safety and privacy, and there's a balance. And what Arrington said on stage, and I'm glad that he kept beating this drum, was that's a false dichotomy. That's a false choice. It shouldn't be that way. Uh, what do you think? Well, um, I mean, you know, many of us outside the U.S. looked at the 
the US to be leaders in this debate about you know the future of democracy and privacy and you know it is some, somewhat disappointing to see uh, those sort of in, innate rights that you guys fought for you know, fought against the British for <laughs> in fact uh, somewhat being uh, you know toned down you know you know and I think you know we all have to ask ourselves what are we what are we in in this game for? Are we in this to, to to just you know to fall down, play dead, and be spied upon for the rest of our lives? Um, Mike Arrington did a, uh, made an interesting point uh, a few weeks ago in one of his uh, posts about about the subject, the extent that you know somebody their their entire life is going to end up on a database, and all of a sudden you decide to kind of attend a, a, a rally about something, and you're you're, you've got a, a black mark against your name. And I think, generally speaking, though, the responses about from these uh, big tech titans like Zuckerberg and Marissa Mayer um, were, uh, I mean, clearly they are in a bind because they've got to uh, they've got to abide by the laws of the uh, you know the laws of the land. And uh, and it, uh, to, to Marissa Mayer made the point. She said, you know, to reveal information about somehow some of this work would be classified as treason. Yeah. Um, but. Um, the, the point, point must be brought back that ultimately, you know, where are the checks and balances? Where are the where's the due process? Where's legal due process? And and are, are people going to have their rights respected? Um, it's it's going, going to be an on the, ongoing debate. Right. Absolutely. And uh, this is a fun crunch week because we have you visiting Mike from from Europe, and I know you're headed back on a plane today. And this is Billy Gallagher's last crunch week, at least of the summer here, because you're headed back to. To Stanford. Yeah, not too far away. Not as far as England, but uh, I'll try to come up for a few country weeks. <laughs> right, right. And you'll be keeping your eyes on, there will still be the next, you know, hot startup coming out of Stanford or the next Snapchat, and I'm sure you'll have your finger on the pulse. Do my best. Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all for watching. That's all the time we have, and uh, have a good weekend.